John Knight, Lone Wolf, Gen 1 Series, by Shaquille Smith. Chicago, Illinois, 1982. Laugh, and the world laughs with you. Weep, and you weep alone. Detective Knight repeats this in his head, mumbling to the cadence of each pronunciation, a constant reminder of Vietnam, a never-ending flashback of horror, which he visits uncontrollably. Detective Knight, a retired vet, and a loving father settled comfortably. One of the best detectives in his time. He had to climb the ranks to earn such a title. It's been five years now, and John has finally got a crack into the Blue Frost case, a new drug that has been destroying Chicago. Corey Bird, an undercover cop that has been on the inside for three years, has finally given up some information. A possible in-person transaction with code ending in two king checkmate, meaning that the leader supplier, Mikey the Don, will be showing his face. It could very well leak outside of the state. Even the president made a note of it. So this case is crucial. John didn't fully trust Corey. It could have been that the photo he got from surveillance showing him sniffing coke from a stripper's ass. Still, he is undercover. He has a role to play. The last thing John needs is the DEA or the feds intervening on something he's worked so hard on. Every bit of information carries weight at this time. An old abandoned factory located on California Avenue has been under surveillance. Since the president had his eyes open, warrants were a breeze, and everything was laid out perfectly. The day is here. The task force has gathered and is waiting for the handoff. John spoke into the radio, trying to ease everyone's nerves. Whoever gets shot is staying behind and cleaning up. The men chuckle under their breath. John continues, You're different, Johnny. We all know that black guy wasn't from the accident. Just avoid the bullets, okay? I'm not going to be the one to bring news to your wife. He could see some of the guys trying to hold their laughter. The atmosphere is tense. Guards on both sides look anxious. If a pin falls, each side will start blasting. In the handoff, the supplier opens up one of the 30 large containers of blue frost. And then the buyer opens three suitcases of cash. That's the signal. The task force jumps into action, breaking the door down with a battering ram. The first wave of officers enters the warehouse, shouting, CPD, hands up! Without hesitation, the guards start shooting, forcing the task force to return fire. The supplier attempted to escape in the middle of the scuffle, but John noticed him and pursued him. Mikey ran out the door, hoping it was the exit. However, it only leads to the top floor. Mikey saw no option but one. John busted through the doors with ease. Gaining on the supplier, Mikey kicked down the last door. There was nowhere else to run. It was either die or surrender. And surrendering wasn't an option for Mikey. John kicks open the slowly shutting door. Freeze! Don't fucking move! Mikey walks around John, trying to size him up. Fuck you, you dirty pig! John has a clean shot on Mikey. He cocks his pistol. I will shoot that pretty mouth clean off, Mikey. Holding his hands up to his side, Mikey tries to negotiate a deal. Listen, detective, how much? How much does two million sound? Mikey mumbled to John. Bribes don't work. Haven't you heard that money's the root of all evil? Mikey laughs, trying to weigh his final options. Then, if money is the root of all evil, why does the most evil always happen to the poor, huh? He reached inside his jacket. John tried stopping Mikey, but his hand was forced. Hey, hey, don't do it! John shoots him dead center right between the eyes. John turns and walks to the door. Funny, you're the evil that's killing the poor. John walks back downstairs to the first floor. The men greet him with excitement, but John isn't excited. It was as if an error code was dropped into his brain. A complete short circuit. 
Was it what Mikey said? As they entered the precinct, a roar of applause met John and the rest of the strike force. John made eye contact with the chief, who nodded in his direction, a silent congratulations. John nodded back, waving to the officers and detectives as he beelined for the front door. Exiting to the cold night air, John was met with a journalist. He covered his face as the flashes of the cameras went off. People had notepads in hands, screaming over each other. Hey, can we get a statement? Sources say Mikey didn't have a weapon on him. Detective Noyd, what case are you taking on next? John reached the car, opening his door before turning back to face the crowd behind him. No comment. The reporters tried surrounding his vehicle to ask some questions, but his tires burned out as he flew out of the parking lot. It was a long ride home, peacefully as he drove down a lonely road, and as usual, John would roll down the windows and light up a cigar to calm his nerves. Today was his daughter's 10th birthday, and he was disappointed in himself that he missed his little girl's day. Still, he did have a special gift, something his father gave him a while back. A family heirloom for good luck. Even though this wouldn't make up for him not being there when she was born, hopefully that one day she would understand. John noticed his wife peeking through the blinds as he pulled up. The dark neighborhood was quiet, except for the dogs barking in the distance. She opened the door for him, kissing him gently on the cheek. John smiled at her. You know, no drug bus could compare to my little girl's birthday, right? His wife looks at him annoyed. You missed the day she was born, John. Nothing's new about today. John walked past her, trying to avoid an argument, and noticed the light snoring of his daughter. He peeked over the couch. Her tiny body was in the fetal position, clutching the police bear he had gotten her from the station. He picked her up gently, steering in the direction of her room when her eyes opened. She gazed at him for a moment before sitting upright, wrapping her arms around him. Mommy told me you got the bad guys. Her grip was tightening. John could feel her shaking a bit. John lifted her head, forcing her to look at him. I did get the bad guy, and I'm sorry I missed your party. Did you like my bear? A smile spread across her face. Jumping out of his arms, she grabbed the stuffed bear, hugging it tightly. John could feel a genuine smile creep across his face. I'm glad you like it. If you ever feel afraid, Mr. Bear will be there to protect you, just like me. John escorted his daughter to her room, saying goodnight as he shut off the lights. Before the door could close, he heard the slight squeaking of his daughter's voice from the darkness. Will you stay with me until I fall asleep? It had been the same as every night. He was unable to deny her. John climbed into his child's bed, digging into his pocket before pulling out an egg figurine. Here, he muttered, giving it to his daughter. What's this? She rolled the egg around in her hand, trying to examine it in the dark room. It's a family heirloom. My father gave that to me when I was about your age. I can't tell you much about it besides the fact that it's good luck. She hopped out of bed, holding the egg close to her chest. The sound of a drawer opening and closing filled the room before her footsteps continued back to the bed. She hopped on to him. Now the egg is safe and won't break. Chuckling a bit, he embraced his daughter in a hug. He held on to her, never wanting to let go and falling into the world of dreams. Waking up the following day to the sound of his neighbor's lawnmower, rattling as if it hadn't been turned on for ages. John looked around the empty child's room. The stuffed bear sat next to him on the nightstand, a note attached to it. Get some rest. I'm taking Abby to school and running some errands. John got ready for work ensuring all the doors and windows were locked. He scribbled something onto a sheet of paper before heading out into the cool morning air. 
When he pulled up to the station, a few officers threw a drunk from holding out onto the street, trying to treat the precinct as a charity hotel. One of them notices John waving to him. Hey, Johnny boy, getting a raise today? Man, your knees are strong. John raised an eyebrow, joking with the officers. That's just because I do my job. And was that the reason why you were limping the other day? They shared a laugh for a moment before John entered the precinct. A few people congratulated John on his way to his desk. He thanked them, prepping himself for the mountain of paperwork he would have to do. He decided to get himself a cup of coffee before starting. John stretched, standing at his desk. The clock on the wall read four. He took a sip from his full mug of coffee. It was ice cold. He got up and went to refill his mug with a fresh hot coffee. The chief saw him. Hey, John, come to my office for a sec. He entered the chief's office. The air struck his face as the door opened, biting at John's cheeks. Sir, with due respect, why do you have the window open in the middle of the winter in Chicago? I've been trying to get that piece of shit fixed now for two years since they reduced our funds. The chief swiveled his chair in the direction of the window, trying to close it the best he could, but the latch got stuck. It opened an inch as soon as he turned his back to it. Take a seat, John. Let's have a chat. Feeling a bit nervous, John sat across from the chief in one of his office leather chairs. Sir, I'm looking forward to... The chief cut him off mid-sentence. John... You're not here for the promotion. Your wife called and said that your daughter's missing. John heard the words of the chief, but Jess smiled at him. Now, John, I got our best guys searching. Just sit tight. Your wife is on the way over. John tried standing, but his legs wouldn't move. He tried speaking, but his voice never came when his mouth opened. The room was quiet and cold. The chief kept talking. He had a sentimental look on his face. John just kept nodding, not hearing anything he was saying. After what felt like just minutes, his wife entered the room. She held a piece of tissue, constantly wiping away the tears that never seemed to stop flowing. She sat next to John, holding his hand. He would react slightly whenever her grip tightened, but never looked at her. Days flew by, and some of the largest search parties in Chicago had gathered to help find John Knight's daughter. John felt closed in and was paranoid, thinking that one of Mikey's boys was out for revenge. He interrogated one of Mikey's men that had been at the drug bus. Where is she? he growled. I'm not saying shit. I want my lawyer. He crossed his arms, sitting back in the chair. A cocky smile smeared across his face. John knew that this guy had the information he needed. Rolling up his sleeves, John threatened him. You tell me where she is, or you'll go missing too. Slowly walking over to the crook side of the interrogation room, John loomed over him, devoid of emotion. The crook stuttered, fearful of the cop. Where, where, where's who? Cut off by a punch in the stomach. Where's my daughter? Every day I have to drive home through a city of flyers, reminding me she's missing. Going home every night to the news, reminding me I've failed to find her. Landing blows against his face between words. So tell me where she is. The crook groaned in pain. His face was bloody, swelling in some places. He fell out of his chair, collapsing on the ground. A police officer burst through the door. Detective Knight, they found something. John kicked the crook once in the stomach before turning to the officer. Show me. It was dawn, and it had been weeks since she had gone missing. Hope had all but been lost. They pulled up to a rocky beach on Lake Michigan. There was already an armada of police vehicles and detectives rushing around. John and his wife got out of the cruiser running through the group of forensic scientists. The bloated, lifeless body sat on the shore. John knew with one look that it was his daughter. She no longer looked like herself, 
bloated beyond recognition, but John knew. His wife's tears turned into a sob as she wailed, rocking back and forth with the body in her arms. Their daughter was dead. Months had flown by. No one from the precinct had seen nor heard from John. The chief had given him leave, and he disappeared after his daughter was found. John threw another empty beer bottle towards the water. It shattered against a rock. He was wearing the same outfit he wore the day they found her. It was dirty and tattered. His ordinarily clean face was now sprouting a full, unkempt beard. John leaned over, opening another beer bottle. A pitcher sat next to him on the rocky beach. He reached for it, but the wind blew it over, exposing the writing on the back. I'm sorry, John. This is a goodbye. We've had it rough over the last couple of years, but you've completely shut me out since Abby passed. I think we should go our separate ways. John picked it up, turning it over to his daughter's smiling face. It was taken on her birthday at her party, the one he had missed. Taking another swig of his bottle, he stood, struggling to catch his balance. Tears are flowing down his face. John falls to his knees, screaming as loud as his voice would allow, until he could scream no more. He stared out at the ongoing crystal blue lake, his thoughts finally clear after weeks. Baby girl, I don't know if you can hear me, but I failed you. I'm sorry. I failed you. Screaming out to the water, I swear to you, I'll find who did that to you, and I will kill them. He collapsed, sobbing. John burst through the doors of the precinct. He was still drunk. The ordinarily busy atmosphere of the building came to a halt as everyone's gaze turned to John. He greeted a few officers before approaching the receptionist. I need to see the files around my daughter's case. The receptionist offered John a solemn look. His voice was soft and warm. John, you know you can't. Why not? He turned to the rest of the precinct. Everyone was staring at him. A few police stood, taking a ready stance. John returned his attention to the receptionist, taking a deep breath. Why can I not see her case file? The receptionist shrugged, explaining, You're too close to the case. You need to take the rest of the leave that the chief gave you before returning to work. I'm sorry, John. The two police officers John had worked closely with on the drug bust approached him. You shouldn't be here, detective. One grabbed his arm, trying to escort him to the door. John snatched his arm away from the officer. No, what I should be doing is finding and killing the sons of bitches who did that to my daughter. He tripped backward, falling down the stairs that led to the reception. The officers, who had grabbed his arm, walked down to him, blocking his way. John, go home. There's nothing you can do. John stumbles out of the precinct. He headed toward his car, parked in an alley across the street from the precinct. He got into his car and passed out. He awoke a couple of hours later. He was sober, but with a throbbing headache. He held his head in distress. Most of the officers had left, replaced by officers that worked the night shift. Movement around the precinct ended. John decided that he'd sneak across the road to the back of the precinct. Now would be the best time to get a look at those files. The chief's broken window latch would be open. He could sneak inside, get the file, and get out. He could hear the chief talking as he approached the window. Another ominous voice was speaking out. John couldn't decipher what they were saying. He snuck closer to the window, sitting right under it, he looked inside. The chief was dressed in a dark robe standing in the middle of a ritual symbol, talking to something in the shadows. The dark figure dressed in a Milford coat, the chief calling it Michael. Chief, 
John can't be allowed to go anywhere near this case. Serpa believes his bloodline is of the Annex. The chief grunted in response. Papers were ruffling aggressively. Chief, as we have discussed, we need to lead him to suicide. If the Annex manifests, I will have your head. Ruffling of papers stopped. The chief sighed. As you wish, sire. Michael's voice was now a loud whisper. Get rid of those files. Nothing should be traced back to us. Any pursuit from John might awaken the Annex. He must forfeit his own life to kill that wretched bloodline. Just get rid of them as soon as you can. The chief agreed. The dark figure disappeared into the darkness of the room, and the symbol disappeared. The chief left the room. John lowered his head from the window, shocked at what he had seen. He questioned if he was going mad at the thought. He waited a moment before climbing in the window. The office was cluttered like usual. Rummaging around the mountain of papers and folders got John nowhere. There was no indication that the file was there. The chief might have taken it as the dark figure suggested. John started towards the window when he noticed that one of the chief's awards was out of its case. Did I move that? Muttering to himself. John placed the award into the case. Just as he turned to walk away, he heard a slight click coming from behind him. His attention whipped back in the direction of the case. A piece of the bottom was sticking out. John opened the secret compartment. A manila folder sat inside. John opened it, shocked by what he found inside. What could it be? Could these be the answers John's been looking for? Find out on the next John Knight Gen 1 series, Tuesday at 3 a.m.